Let's do it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another week here on the Big Man's Report Live. I am your host, Blake Roselle. On News Talk 1492.3 WOND, I hope you guys all had another great weekend. Last week's show, I had on ESPN Analysis, College Basketball, um, you know, Westwood One, Sirius XM, John Crispin. We had a great, great program, talked a lot about his life growing up in South Jersey, uh, becoming a wonderful, um, you know, icon for the youth uh, in college sports. And he did, a, he did a great job on the program, and it was nice to have him in the studio, talked a lot about his life playing overseas, you know, playing UCLA, Penn State, and, and his, you know, he comes from a basketball family. So now he does ESPN analysis, and he had a great story. And he also um, told a lot about, um, you know, his personal life, you know, some triumphs and things that he battled uh, himself. But actually, and he pushed through, you know, on his, when he would go to do these, call these big games, and he'd have to go to hotel rooms, and he told us stories about, and shared some stories about his past. So thank you, John, for coming on. I'm looking forward to do some great projects with him in the future. Uh, you know, John, again, we, you know, we'll do something later on at a later date. But if for all of those, those of you that did not get to hear that show, it is now on my YouTube channel, The Big Man Show Live. And you guys always know my Instagram, my Facebook, The Big Man's Report underscore live. Check everything out, all my content. It's always there, available for you. So this week, I'm very excited for this show. This has been a, um, something that I was looking forward to for some time now. Uh, I've seen this gentleman online, I want to say, a few years back. And I saw his one skit of comedy about, you know, if we had an Italian president, what would the country be running like? And I, that video stuck with me. I loved it. And it's, I would, I'm kind of honored here today to be able to say that I'm actually speaking with this gentleman um, on my show. And I'm delighted. Um, so I'd like to, about in a second, introduce uh, my dear friend here. Uh, this gentleman is big in comedy, uh, does tours all over the country. Um, you know, he's very well known, also is big in acting, has a lot of other things on the side that he, that he works on some projects, um, you know, and he's doing, he's doing his thing, he's funny, he's hilarious, you see him all over YouTube, we're going to get into all his, uh, all his acts and all his funny stuff, and also, I'm also delighted to be on his show in a couple of weeks, I'll be airing on, on, um, on his podcast, Live from My Mother's Basement, uh, so a lot of great things coming up, I'm excited for this. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my main man, Mike Marino. Mike, how well, you doing? Hey, man. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And thank Absolutely. you for coming all the way up from Atlantic City to be in my house to do your show. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I don't have to leave. <laughs> no, it's great. Listen, I, I was looking forward to this. And I, I want to start off by saying that video, uh, uh, you know, if, if we had an Italian president, the country would be saved in three months, not four yes. years. <laughs> Everybody has their version of the way the joke went. That's the company, the, the country would be saved in three months. It's not the way it went at all, but that's, that's really cool, and I'm, I'm glad. First of all, I want to say, I'm, now I know why they call you the big man. You are huge. <laughs> you got the big dude in the basement. Um, that joke was told first on a military comedy tour when we first started going to war with Osama bin Laden and that whole nine yards when they went go looking for him, right? So me and a bunch of comedians from the Laugh Factory in Los Angeles went out to Afghanistan, Baghdad, Kuwait. We were entertaining all the troops and stuff. But it also makes you realize that they can't leave once we're done out there entertaining. Mm -hmm. And you feel bad because the majority of the men and women enlisted in the military are 19, 20, 21, they're kids. Yeah. All jacked up with these machine guns, and, and it's kind of like, wow, what the hell? And you're trying to give them a taste of America, an apple pie. So when everybody's cracking jokes and whatnot, I just said to myself, geez, wouldn't it be great if I was like the president of the United States and I told everybody, you don't have to come. I don't need the Army. I don't need the Marine Corps. Me and some of my friends from New Jersey, we'll take care of this. Mm -hmm. And we'll go home and we'll solve the problem. And gas prices will go down to 30 cents. <laughs> and they just went wild. Yeah. So some time went by and I was asked to do the joke on the Byron Allen show. And that's when it went viral. I think it was like 15 million people in uh, a few months. Wow. Yeah, I mean, and that was one of the first things that I saw um, of yours, right? I, I saw that. I came across that video a few, a few a years back, and I know you said they filmed that a, a while ago, um, but that caught my attention. And listen, I come from an uh, Italian, we come from an Italian background as well on my father's side. 
So we're used to all the joking around and then, and, you know, all the funny stuff. So when you see something like that, you kind of connect with it. You're like, what you hear in the house, what you grow up, you grow up hearing. Yeah, if we had an Italian president, you know, things would be different. We wouldn't go through all this nonsense, all this bull crap, and things would be, <laughs> be settled instantly. So I saw that. I said, man, this guy, this guy's great. This guy's funny. And I checked out a lot more of your content. Um, but I thought that was, and that's something we'll, you know, our viewers and our listeners will can go on YouTube if they haven't seen that. Um, you know, you, you did that skit. It was great. I hope so. I really uh, encourage it. It was a lot of fun. I'm very, very lucky. It turned into a web series. It turned into my own podcast. And the joke keeps on going, which helps me sell tickets when I go somewhere to perform live. And, of course, you come up with more and more new stuff about that. So this whole web series that we did, Make America Italian Again, hit mm -hmm. some big numbers. And I plan on doing more. And, uh, you know, people ask me, am I really running for president? Sometimes when I watch the news, I feel like, oh, maybe I should. I got plenty of time. I'm not married. I have no kids. I'm like, you know what? Put me in the White House. Let me take over. But, you know, what if I did? I'd probably get fired right away because I'll be on television going, this sucks. What the hell's the matter with you people? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But maybe that's what we really need. Mm -hmm. we so, need yeah, we need someone like that. Exactly. Because um, that's, that's what the country feels like. We need that right now. Um, but listen, I, I, I always do with my guests, I like to um, always tell their story, right? It's always important to hear, you know, how you became successful and how you got to the point that you're going, that you got to today. So I always like to backtrack and I would like, so your childhood, you grew up here in, uh, on, in New Jersey, right? Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're born and raised in New Jersey. Tell us a little bit about your family life growing up, uh, you know, the, the, the house you grew up in and, and what got you into, you know, what you're doing today. A little bit tell our viewers. Well, you know... My uh, family is all from Italy, everybody, you know, all Bruzzese, and like mass amounts of other Italians who came over from uh, the other side, going through the island, stopped in Jersey City. If you remember back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, Jersey City was just like a hub of Italians on every block, safe neighborhood, food everywhere, and everybody knew everybody. Most people got married with people that they knew from the area, kind of keeping that together. Then, of course, uh, Jersey City changed, and an influx of different cultures made the Italians move out. Mm -hmm. Now we're here in the suburbs. So this town right here, Scotch Plains, New Jersey, has a lot of Italian people. And this town is immaculate, clean, everybody's friendly, everybody knows everybody. So this is the town where I grew up going to uh, high school and playing in marching band and being a drummer. It's really all I ever wanted to do. But I started in the acting business when I was like 12, 13 years old. All I ever wanted to be was Robert De Niro. I'm like, I could be De Niro. So I grew up impersonating TV commercials. Uh, I would impersonate um, comedians that I would listen to their albums. And you know, of course my parents, well at least my mother's side, more immigrants than anything. They didn't know what the hell I was doing. They didn't know I was going to have a future in show business. Everybody thought I was going to work for my father like everybody else and do construction. Right. But I didn't. So I started going to acting school when I was around 12, 13 years old, and I started doing TV commercials. When I started doing TV commercials, the recognition and the money was just phenomenal. But you figure I'm the opposite of a real traditional Italian-looking guy. I have blonde hair, blue eyes. I looked like I was some Irish dude from the beach. So I got to do uh, potato chip commercials, M&M's, uh, Zit Cream, and you name it. And some of the commercials ended up being really famous commercials. So that's where I started making really great money. So back in the 70s and the 80s, you do one TV commercial in a day, and you don't have to work for the rest of the year, mm -hmm. especially if it ran national. So that's what I was doing. I really didn't get into stand-up comedy till I was 29, 30 years old. There was a talent coordinator, his name is Bob Gonzo. He was out on the Jersey Shore. He used to run Rascals Comedy Club, okay. which is a famous comedy club. There was one in uh, West Orange, New Jersey, and there was one in uh, Eatontown, New Jersey, on Route 35. And they were packed all the time. Because this is before TikTok. This is before Instagram. No Facebook. People went out to go watch these shows. No matter who was performing, it didn't matter. You didn't have to be some TikTok superstar. People wanted to go see the show. So a Tuesday night open mic back in the day was packed. It was like watching the gong show. People couldn't wait to go in there and go, let's see who's going to get tortured. Mm -hmm. Right? Because if somebody went on stage and they sucked, 
the audience was laughing anyway because, oh, man, boy, does he suck. You know, you're talking about almost a time where you could throw a tomato at somebody and it would be funny. Yeah. Right? So that's where I was going, and everybody was telling me, yeah, you're really, really funny. But since I came from an acting background, it was easy to transition into the other one. So now I'm in Los Angeles most of the time. You start playing the comedy store, the Laugh Factory. I got lucky, started meeting all these great people. Ended up getting more movie roles as a comic than I did as an actor. Mm -hmm. Because you, can, you have the opportunity to be seen more as a comedian than anything else. Right. And that's, that's what I like. Now I'm addicted. I want to do stand-up 24-7. I'll do an afternoon party if I have to. I'll stand in front of 10,000 people. I'll stand in front of two people. It's fun. Yeah. And it's fun, you know? And the most important thing is you enjoy it. I mean, you, you, you get, obviously, you get joy out of what you're doing. I can't wait to go to work. <laughs> People call me, oh, I got to go to work. Not me. I can't wait. Where are we going? Yeah. Where are we going? How far? What? A plane ride for 15 hours? Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. How many people going? And it's fun. You know, yeah. I like when people call me for their podcasts. I like when I get these celebrities to come on my podcast. I'm like, I can't believe they're showing up. But the bottom line is we're really all just human beings anyway. So you could be famous on Monday and you could be a screw up on a Friday. Mm -hmm. So I take everything with a with a light heart and a joy. Thank you, Lord. Let's keep on going. Yeah. And the and the most important thing is to like you, people need to laugh, right? Comedy is so important because no matter how you take comedy, you know, some people would especially you've probably experienced this throughout your career so far. You know, when things you say, some people may get offended, right? You can't, you know, oh don't go to the show if you don't like what I'm saying, right? But you're gonna. You're there to make people laugh because they feel like the world needs laughter, right? So people being funny brightens up people's day. It brightens up people's, you know. So what you're doing, you're going to work every day to make people laugh, um, and that's something that you know you're kind of helping people get through. Say somebody's going through something, right? Hey, I'm gonna go to Mike Marino's show. I'm gonna get my my girlfriend got me tickets. You know, this this guy's great. He's making us laugh, right? So you enjoy what you're doing, and then you're putting smiles on other people's faces. So how does that make you feel as a, as a as a you know being a, a in comedy? It's uh, an o overwhelmingly great feeling, and I'll tell everybody why. If you can help somebody for any weird reason in life, and you do it, you don't expect anything in return, you will feel great about yourself. It's just the way it is. I guess sometimes you have to admire people who are EMTs, that they run into the face of the disaster and they glorify how great it is, that feeling, that they saved somebody. I couldn't because I'm squeamish, but in the laughter arena, I can do it. So I'll give you an example. Every morning I do the thing called the morning walk. I walk around on my Instagram and I tell everybody about my day. And I did it because of the pandemic. In the pandemic, I'm like, what am I gonna do with myself? But I'm older and I uh, wanna stay healthy, so I walk. My producer, Tatiana, she was like, why don't you do it on Instagram and see if anybody watches and anybody talks to you? Well, now, if I don't do it, people text me like, where are you? Is everything all right? So people write to me now and they say things like, thank God for you. I watch you every morning. You make my day. And then they'll instant message me and tell me what their problems were and how I helped them get out of that situation. Because we all have the same identical problems. We really do. It could be a relationship, a divorce, a parent, a drug, anything. A cut, a car accident. Everybody goes through the same experience. Kind of hope that you don't, but you will. So you can actually help people by telling them your own experience. And they'll be like, oh my God, I thought I was the only one. Because mm -hmm. I feel that way, that way too. I'm like, I can't believe I'm... Uh, I didn't get that particular job. And other people are like, yeah, I can't believe I didn't get it either. I'm like, oh, I thought I was the only one. I can't believe I have this ailment. Oh, I got it too. Here's what you should do. Oh, I got heartburn. Oh, I take this medication. You should try that. So everybody can help each other mm -hmm. in a fun way. So I do it. So here's the most recent one. You digging in? This girl calls me up. Well, she writes to me on uh, Instagram. Right. Oh, I'm getting married. And I'm going to have a brunch wedding. How much? And I write back and I say, you want me to entertain at your wedding on a brunch? She says, yeah, because I see at night you're performing in Princeton. I'm not too far away. Can you come? How much? 
So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to put my price on this and I'll go do it. Then from there, I'm going to drive to my shop. So this is the way we um, route ourselves to stay, in, stay relevant and do as many shows as possible in the same area. So I says, uh, how are you having a wedding so fast? Usually people have three months of a warning. Yeah. I just happened to be in town. This was like in 10 days. And I am doing a show in that area at night. So, okay, I'll come by. But when I said, how many people are going to be at your party? This is where I've come up with price. She writes me back, oh, we're only going to have about 50 people. My husband has stage four brain cancer and we need to get married right away. I want to add him to my insurance and this is his bucket list. He's a huge fan and this would be great for him. So if you could come, this would make him so happy. So I says, how old? And she said, he just turned 30. So I said, here's my price, free. I'm coming for free. I don't want anything, and I don't want you to tell anybody I'm coming. And I'm not coming alone. I'm coming with an opening act. I'm coming with a singer, and a friend of mine's a caterer. I'm gonna ask her if she'll donate some kind of a cake or some cookies or some pies. Well, this lady loses her mind. I can't believe this, holy shit. And I says, if I can make you happy just for this one particular moment, I'm gonna do it. So, I call up some of my friends, and away we went. I call up a friend, Mary Ann Axton. She has this uh, company that caters with these delicious cakes and pies and cookies. She shows up with an $800 cake. My buddy shows up, he starts doing some jokes. Another guy's doing some hand card tricks and they are losing their minds. Then I step on stage and I'm like, it's 12 o'clock. I don't want eggs and bacon at a, at a, at a wedding. I want the full nine yards. I want this, I want that. And I started just making fun of them. They were laughing and screaming and joking. Everybody had some fun. The guy starts crying. I can't believe you came here. I'm like, listen, man, you need to start thinking you're gonna get through this shit. We need you. Yeah. But look what I did. And these people were so happy. And I didn't want anything. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like, how, how am I, me, this man's bucket list to yeah. show up and meet me in person that's on his bucket list yeah so how am i not flying like wow look what i did yeah i never met him he watched this on the internet maybe he came to a show but these people are now my friends and they're on my guest list for free whenever however i'll probably see them this coming thursday night at a show but that's because i went to work and I feel like the greatest thing ever. I mean, I, I'll do that anytime, anywhere, as long as I can. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an incredible story. I mean, that's just, just, hear, just hearing how, you know, you really, made, you really made this couple's day. I mean, just by doing those kind of things, right? Um, so I think the biggest, the biggest motivator for you is that you can, you're able to do those things. You're able to touch people's hearts in certain ways, right? Um, so that's that's actually one of the things that in anything if you're in comedy if you're whatever you're doing to make someone's day to make someone's to build up someone and with their morale when they're down is a great feel. I mean, you know, on my show here, I, I I like to tell people stories and how they got where they're at. You know, sure, and most of the time, about ninety nine percent of the time, it wasn't easy for these people to get to where they're at. So I like to to show them off. I like to really you know express you know their feelings and how they and how they got to their point. So. That's actually an amazing story, Mike. I tell me that actually he was thinking about that. He just said you went to these people and they were they were very happy. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a, that's a great that's a great story. And I think obviously the world needs to be more like that. Those kind of things. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, I hope I hope it keeps on going. I enjoy it. I, I love fans and I, I you know mm -hmm. it drives you, it keeps hate, you going. I, it, it keeps me going. I hate to hear sad stories like that. I just was actually texting my producer, so we are definitely going to do some really cool stuff together. And uh, awesome, is that cool? Are yeah, yeah, working? we're good. Yes, we're good. So, um, one of the things I also wanted to ask you too, like, obviously, you come from the Italian background, right? You kind of told me a little bit about your heritage growing up. Um, 
What was what was growing up in the house with mom and dad? Like how you, 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 oh, you gotta man. tell me some funny stories. Here. I wish we could do it again. Shit. <laughs> That's why I called my show live from my mother's basement, because we're actually in the basement. And back in the day when you were a kid, man, this is where everybody played. This is where you uh, got your, your clothes put together to go out into the snow, your boots, your plastic bags that you put around your feet to shove in your boot to go stand in the snow. Everybody's running around. There were kids all over this block going to school. And your mother was upstairs yelling and screaming, you're hungry? Who wants to eat? Come on up, you sons of bitches. You know, I got an older brother and a younger brother. We would wrestle down here, you know, uh, the whole nine yards. And then the holidays was always spent down here. Mm -hmm. uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, you name the holiday. My mother was the cook, and everybody came down here and, uh, and packed the house. Now, it don't happen that way no more. And everybody's like, let's make reservations. I'm like, I got a basement. <laughs> you what? Where? Is there, is there pollution down there? Is there, like... Uh, Whatever these pipes used to be. Asbestos? <laughs> we all made it. Everybody's yeah. alive. It, 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 yeah, I mean, it, I like hearing those stories because it's funny because, you know, you come from a close-knit family, you're Italian, so that also helps you as your as now your career. Because, you again, your comedy can be is turned into, you know, those things that you take from your childhood experiences. And what I noticed, too, about your comedy is you say, you know, you say things that everybody's thinking but won't say. Oh, yeah. That's the biggest thing. Everybody's thinking it, Mike, but no one says it. You're that outlet for people to say it and laugh. It's actually not that they won't say it. It's just that comedians have this something in their brain that reminds you of what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it's called, some kind of recallability, but everything I see, to me, I could make funny. As soon as I look at it, I'm going to bring something funny to the table about it, and most people laugh because... They say, oh my God, that's my family. Oh my God, that happened to me. Oh my God, I seen that. We just bring it to the front of your brain. Right. Like right now, while we're sitting here, I'm looking at my washer and dryer and I'm saying to myself, how come I lost the sock? How could it be? And everybody will think this, yeah, that's right, I lost the sock. Where the hell was it? And you could spend hours looking for it. Is it under the machine? Is it in the crack of the machine? Where did it go? And the thing is, you can't find it. But maybe six weeks will go by, and you're like, oh my God, this is the fucking song. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on your show. We'll bleep you. Yeah. Bleep that. <laughs> bleep, bleep. Um, and then you find it. And then, but people are going to go, that's me. I lose a sock every week. <laughs> yeah. So that's the way we come up with the material. Plus, family always works. Because mm -hmm. most people come from family, even if it's, even if it's from a, uh, a screwed up family. Yeah, and that's important too. Like you know, when you're thinking of these things, and when you come up with your material, I think a lot of it you, you probably prescribe. You know, tell me if I'm wrong, but you would think about the things that you grew up thinking at home, right? Things that you thought were funny, maybe your parents said to you, and you're like, that still applies today. It still holds true today. And again, you bring it to the front of everyone's brain. That's why comedy's so fun, and that's why people get a laugh out of it, right? Um, so, take me when you're when you're getting into your comedy world. Um, what are some, when you first stepped on that stage, what was one of your first performances um, or your, you know, one of your first acts that you, that you did and you're like, wow, holy shit, there's a lot of people here. Or you're like, wow, this is really neat. Like what, what was like the feeling that you had when you, when you went in front of a big crowd for the first time, when you first got started in your career? Well, there's so many. Do you have a certain experience that you remember, mm -hmm. a certain one that sticks with you today? Oh yeah. The first time I ever did stand up comedy I was 28, 29 years old, and there was like a comedy competition at a bar in Bayonne. And I was there during the week, and all my friends from the Jersey Shore, my little beach house escapades, we all got together for some midweek drinks, and we went to this place called the Sunrise Pine Room in Bayonne. And we knew the owner of the joint, and that's why we went. We went to get some drinks and some food. But they were having like an open mic and a contest the winner would get 50 bucks so i'm sitting here with my friends and i'm like hey look at these comedians everybody's telling these jokes and telling jokes so why don't you get up there i'm like i'll get up there i can go for 50 bucks because i was doing tv commercials i figured i know how to do it so i went up there and i just started talking about my mother you know what my mother said i ain't cooking no more i'm sick of this crap and i won the 50 bucks so then i figured well that was pretty easy maybe i could do it again 
And then uh, some time went by and I figured, let me do a one-man show. So I wrote about an hour's worth of material. I went to the Sunrise Pine Room and I did a one-hour special. But I, I really wasn't thinking I was going to keep on doing this. And there was about maybe 100 people watching. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, 2006, uh, a radio personality like yourself, Steve Travelese from 101.5 in New Jersey, he was doing some stand-up with me, and he said, you know, you could be the Bruce Springsteen of stand-up comedy, the blue-collar comic. And I says, yeah, that'd be a great idea. And he said, too bad the Paramount in Asbury Park has been condemned for 20 years. That would be a great place to film a special. And I go, yeah, I remember that theater. This is old theater way back in the day, created 1928. So I said, let him go down there. I'm like, where am I going to get that kind of a crowd in a deserted town right but I ended up getting a development deal from a company in California they gave me a certain amount of money so I said all right let's go rent the Paramount well since they don't use it and no one's ever been in it in a long long time they gave it to me for free oh. and they said if you can get a hundred people to come and sit in this 1600 seat theater we'd be shocked mm -hmm. so we had I think six months of publicity and then the night of the shoot, 1,600 people showed up. Wow. 1,600. Packed. Well, actually, it was 1,700. They had to kick 100 out. And we filmed the show. It was the greatest night of my life. That was the first time I ever stood in front of that many people. My heart was pounding. <laughs> and when you walk out and you see that many people, I mean, 1,700. And you're like, what's up? Yeah. And they just start screaming. And the cameras are shooting. It's just the greatest feeling in the world. I mean, you're high as a kite. And I ended up doing that theater every summer for 10 years. Wow. And now that they remodeled the whole thing, and it's state of the art. And right. I really wish I could do that all over again, because what a great time. And mind you, there's no social media. It's a time where people word them out. Exactly. Word them out. You had to go on radio shows and hope, hope, pray. Mm -hmm. I was praying for 500 people. So. Uh, about 10 minutes to showtime, a fire marshal came backstage. And uh, there's like 10 people back there, all the cameras getting ready to go. And the fire marshal goes, who's in charge? And I said, I'm in charge. He goes, we have a very serious problem, young man. You're at capacity. And there's 100 people outside trying to get in. I go, that ain't a problem. That's success. <laughs> Shut the door. Let's shoot. <laughs> you know, because yeah. they're thinking, uh, we've never seen this before. I'm like, surprise. <laughs> so that must have made you feel real good. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, you're talking about a theater where Bruce Springsteen rehearses. Yeah. Bon Jovi, this is a legacy. The first few shows at the Paramount in Asbury Park was the Marx Brothers, mm -hmm. uh, Abbott and Costello. Yeah. So it's a legendary place. Uh, Flappers, dancers, I mean, come on. Sinatra. A lot of history there, and that's, and that's an honor that you were able Big to history. perform there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's, that, that's, that's really a great story. And uh, that suspense for the first time is always, like, gets you feeling like, you know, um, it just makes you really feel like, wow, like, this is, the, I, I'm here. Yeah. I did it. Can I pull it off? Yeah, can I, can I do this? Can I pull it off? I remember my first time three years ago on my first radio show, I'm like, I, I finally, like, the, the on-air on lights go on, I look at the ceiling, and I said, oh, crap, I'm actually on the air right now. And I just started, uh, well, welcome to my first show. And you know, I started to get into like a rhythm after. But I remember that the, the feeling that I got in the beginning. I'm like, I don't know who's listening. I you know my mom's listening, you know. You no, know, my dad's listening, but who else? So I, I kind of get that, that, got that feeling as well. So it's definitely something that you remember, you know, it stays with you. Um, I, yeah, I know you do performances now all over, all over the country going, so now you're out in California a lot. What's one of your favorite places to perform where the people always want you to come back? You know, I'm sure everywhere they well, do, but... No, one of the most famous clubs in California is, of course, the Comedy Store on the Sunset Strip. That's where I started in Los Angeles, the Comedy Store. Mm -hmm. And then I went over to the Laugh Factory. So the Laugh Factory in Los Angeles is my home club now, and it's probably the second most famous, if not the most famous, comedy club in the world, and there's a bunch of them. There's a Laugh Factory in Hollywood, Long Beach, California, San Diego, California, Corona, California, or Covina, California. Vegas, mm -hmm. Reno, and they're just super great clubs. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm lucky. So when I get there, yeah, I do have an audience that shows up. You have your regulars, I'm sure. The regulars. <laughs> I yes. love that word, the regulars. The regulars. They're great, man. Yeah. 
And, they, and they're your supporters. They're always going to, I mean, listen, you got tons of supporters, but you in built, building new audiences too is great. Yeah, that's why you keep doing what you're doing because you get those new audiences that come on. Every um, show you can get a lot of fans from, and of course now with uh, Instagram and YouTube and all this wonderful stuff in this show, you can pick up a lot of followers, hopefully, and they enjoy what you do and don't say anything negative, just uh, <laughs> laugh and have fun. Uh, well, Mike, we're actually going to commercial break real quick. So 